Well, good evening, everyone. For those of you who, uh, who don't know, or it, it has been so long since I have gotten the chance to be here. Uh, my name is Stefan, in case you have forgotten, or this is the first time we are meeting. Uh, I am, uh, I am, th there have been a lot of changes that have happened since the last time I was here. Um, so I've been married to my wife for almost nine years this year. We're very excited about that. But the big change that happened for us over this past, since the last time I was here is uh, we had a son. My son Nathan was born in July. Um, he is almost seven months old now. And, uh, you know, somebody told me when we, were, when we were getting ready to have him, somebody told me the second one is easier. I, I hear a lot of people laughing out there because apparently somebody was joking with me or lying to me because I have found out that that is not the truth. Two is not easier than one, and two is not twice as difficult as one. It seems to be some kind of an exponential growth. Sorry, uh, uh, I'm a math teacher and, and a science teacher, so it's, it's an exponential growth. It's not one plus one is two. It's one plus one is like four times the work or something. They lied. They lied. But he is a wonderful little boy. He is, he is such a pleasure. He's such a joy to have. As long as we, uh, at first we had to figure out what we could actually eat because he has colic. And so my wife had to cut out dairy, soy. Did you know there's soy in practically everything in the grocery store? She had to cut out everything. And then he turned into a happy, cheerful, wonderful little boy. And we are just so glad to have him now. Uh, but uh, that, that's uh, enough about me there. Let's, we're, we're about to dive into a brand new book here. We're about, well, a new book. This, this book has been around for, for a few years. Um, we're we're going to be diving into the book of Joshua. So why don't we pray before we, uh, before we get started? Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity for us to meet together for us to open your word together. And Lord, I just pray that you, would, uh, that you would move within us today. I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that uh, uh, the words that come out of my mouth would be yours and that they would bring you glory and that they would have a message for all of us to hear tonight. God, please speak to us. In your name, amen. So we're going into Joshua here. Before we go into it, though, when I graduated from high school, I had a plan. I knew exactly where I was going to go. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to be a doctor. I wanted to be not just any doctor. I wanted to be an ophthalmologist, one of the, the eye, crazy eye doctors. I thought that was really cool. I had Nothing to do with the fact that I was going through crazy eye stuff at the time. But after I graduated from high school, I went on a missions trip to Kenya for a month. And while I was over there, I was, I was working at orphanages, and uh, I blew through the only fun reading book I had in uh, about, a, well, actually on the plane trip over. And so for the course of that month, this was my reading material. And about three days in, I had this random thought. You should be a youth pastor. Well, I thought that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> but it kept coming back and stronger and stronger. And there, there, was, this, there was this call. And you're like, hold on, you just said you're a teacher. What, what happened there? I'll, I'll tell you more of my story as we continue on here. But I heard a call from God. Have you ever heard a call from God? Have you ever had a call? But perhaps you thought, well, that's dumb. That's not on my plan. 
that's not what I want to do, or, or that's too big, that's too scary. Scripture is full of people who were called to do things that seemed big and seemed scary. Joshua was one of those. Let me set the background here to this book here before we dive into his call here. So, the people of Israel, Israelites, God's chosen nation. Before they were an official nation, they were slaves in Egypt. And God sent this guy named Moses to go and bring them out of Egypt. The strongest nation in the world at the time. God brings them out of Egypt and he brings them through some crazy circumstances. He sends plagues on Egypt to get them to finally let them go and then drowns the Egyptian army in this, in this Red Sea that he parts and then and lets everybody walk through and then closes it back on top of the Egyptians behind them. And then God shows himself to them on a mountain, makes a covenant with them, and he brings them to the promised land. And they're at the, they're at the boundary. They, they just have to take a step. And they decide, we're going to send in some spies so we can go see what we're, what, what's coming up ahead. And they sent 12 men to go and spy on the land. And they go in there and they find this land that God has promised them. It is the promised land. God said it is a good land. And they get there and they find out it is a good land. There is fertile land for growing crops. There is uh, there, there, the fruit, the, the grapes grow, grow this big. There's a slight problem though. Since it's such a great position, it's such a great location, other nations have already gone and established themselves there. And the spies look at it and they say, oh, that's scary. The 12 come back. Two of them say, God can get it, give this to us. God has promised this land to us, Joshua and Caleb. But the other 10 say, no, it's too scary. In fact, they start lying about the land. They say it is full of, the land literally swallows people up. There are giants living there. If we go there, it is certain death for us. And the nation of Israel chooses to listen to the ten instead of the two. And so God says, fine. You don't have to go. In fact, you can't go. You will spend the next 40 years wandering until every single one of you that should have known better, you watch the plagues. You watch the Red Sea part. You watched me provide food for you out of nowhere. You should have known better. You will wander until every single one of you who should have known better, other than Joshua and Caleb, because they're good guys, are dead. And so they wander for 40 years. And here we are at the end of those 40 years. Moses has been leading the nation all this time. And they come to the promised land again. And this time, Moses isn't coming with them. Moses has passed away. And it is into those circumstances here that we start our passage we are reading Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. If you have your books or you have your Bibles, read with me. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot tre treads I have given to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the, wilder the wilderness in this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. 
No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, if you're like me, we don't pick up everything from the first read. Let's take it verse by verse here. Take it, take it piece by piece here. Because this is God's call to Joshua. And there are a few key parts to God's call here that I want us to look at here. Back to verse 1. It came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Okay. Moses is dead. I want you guys to picture this for a second. Think about who is the most impressive person that you have ever met. Who is the person that, that you think has done the most with their life? Okay. Now imagine you have to step in and take that person's place. Now, Joshua. Joshua has been serving Moses. He's, he's been Moses' right-hand man for the past 40 years. Moses has been training him up. But there's a big difference between being the trainee and still having the person that you're looking up to, being there who's really in charge, and all of a sudden having to take the reins yourself. Okay, let's, let's so it automatically, You've heard the phrase, big shoes to fill, right? right? So Joshua has big shoes to fill. So let's just, let's just look at the shoes that he has to fill, okay? So Joshua has to lead God's people. This is an entire nation, okay? So he's, 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 he's becoming leader of a nation. Here's, here's my boot-sized shoe. Okay. Now, Moses has been leading for over 40 years, Let's, let's make that a little bit bigger of a boot. That's, that's a little large there. Okay. Um, uh, then uh, Moses literally spoke voice to voice with God. That's, I'm going to run out of space here pretty soon here. But uh, Moses spoke words of mouth to mouth with God. God said Moses was greater than a prophet because prophets get visions from God. But God literally spoke to Moses as if to a friend. Then Moses is the guy they equate with leading them through the Red Sea, parting the waters. Moses is the guy who led them out of Egypt. I'm running out of space. It's a really big shoe already. Joshua has to take this task. He has to step into this guy's shoes. That's scary. That's scary. And here's what he's supposed to do. Verse 3. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. Okay, now, we don't have a great conception of of the geography of the Middle East, just in the, t in the back of our heads here. But if you have a map in the back of your Bible, you might be able to see this is not a small land 
that we're talking about here. And there are people living in it. God's call to Joshua is, hey, lead my people and go and conquer this land. It's an intimidating call. That's the first thing. The call, the job that Joshua gets, it comes from God. Then what does God say? In verse 5, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. God starts with the call. Here's what I need you to do. Then he tells him, You will succeed. God doesn't give us impossible tasks that we are doomed to fail in. God did not give Joshua something that he could not do. God told Joshua, you will succeed because I will be with you. God's not a mean boss who says, here, here's this job. Good luck. You've got this much time. And uh, if you fail, you're fired. God walks through this with you. If you are being called to do something, know that it is not just you that has to do it. God is the one who will walk through it with you, and God gives the victory. So what does Joshua even have to do other than, you know, start walking, I guess? Verse 7 and 8. Only be strong and very courageous. He he said that twice now. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. What was the law which Moses commanded him? If you want to, if if you're bored one night or you really want to, you, you can go through and you can read Leviticus and you can read Deuteronomy. And you can see the books of the law, and you can, you can see all the commands there. But Moses' last words, the, the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' last words to the people. And he basically boils it down to one key thing. You have a choice. Here are your options. Follow God and be blessed. Reject God and pay the consequences. Follow God, be blessed by having a relationship with a God who loves you, a God who wants the best for you, a God who will give you the victory, a God who will take care of you and wants to be with you, or choose to reject him. Try things on your own. See how that goes. It usually doesn't go well. And so he tells Joshua, Follow what Moses told you. Do not go to the right or to the left. Stay focused in the center. Now, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. This book, the Bible, God's word, this is what Joshua needs to stay grounded in. This is what we need to stay grounded in. When we are called, God gives the call. God gives the victory. What God calls us to do is stay connected to him. He's the one who does the victory. You don't have to do it yourself. You let God work through you. But how are you going to do that if you don't know him? And the way to know him is right here. He says, follow these words, and then you will be prosperous, and then you will have success. Gives Joshua the entire formula. Last part of his call. After giving him the call, the victory, and what he needs to do. He says, Have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. The third time, fine. Probably need to listen. Be strong and courageous. God is encouraging Joshua. He's giving him a command. He says, do it. Why? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So God starts with call, victory, what he needs to do. I mean, he's done talking. Get going. Have I not commanded you? That's a rhetorical question. He just commanded him. So go. Go to it. What do we do with this? Because that's a great story. This, this, is, this is inspiring. This is, this is so cool what God did for Joshua. How do we take it home? That, that was that Joshua lived thousands of years ago. I mean, it's, it's a great story, but what about me? What do I do with this today? What do I do with this from this moment on as I leave the doors? Okay. A couple things. First one. God gave the command. God told him what to do. Stay in the word. You've been called to do something. Stay connected to God. God is the one who gives you the job, who gives you the victory, and is with you through all of it. You need to stay connected to him. Okay? Stay in the word because it's all about God. Number two, be strong and courageous. He said that three times in a very short period of time. Be bold, be brave, be strong and courageous. Joshua was called to lead an entire nation. I don't know what you're being called to do, I don't know what you've been called to do, but given the fact that I don't think anybody in here has been president, I'm guessing our job is not as difficult as Joshua's was. Be strong and courageous. Why? Because God's the one who gives us the job and the victory, and he's with us through all of it. So, you've been called. Go to it. But what if you don't know what you've been called to? And like, that's, that's a great story there. And Joshua has an unfair advantage. God literally spoke to him in a voice. What about me? Where's my heavenly phone call? I haven't heard a voice come out of heaven, other than my booming voice out of the speakers, but not, not the same. Not the same. What if I don't know what to do? So I told you I, I felt called to be a youth pastor, right? But I'm a teacher. How did I get here? What happened between then and now? I went to, I got done with that missions trip, and I said, fine, God. Show me the way you want me to go, and I will follow you. And so I Went back. I still went up to school. I did my major in biochemistry, all with the plan of going and being a youth pastor afterwards. But the pastors at my church in Flagstaff said there are easier ways to go about becoming a youth pastor than biochemistry. Just saying. <laughs> it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It was not easy. But it was, it was what I felt like God was telling me to do. And so I go through that, and then I graduate from NAU with a biochemistry degree, and I start looking for youth pastor positions, and boom, I get one, and I just, I, I should probably go to seminary to, you know, actually get some kind of a biblical background other than, you know, the biochemistry degrees are great and all, but, you know, I probably want some training in, in biblical interpretation and you know all that fun stuff uh, maybe learn a language or two that kind of stuff um, uh, and so, so I come down here and I start serving as a youth pastor and I serve for, uh, for several years and, then, and then, then God calls me to move on 
this is my third year in seminary and I, I, I'm, I've got two more to go. I spend those next two years working at a coffee shop wondering what in the world am I going to do. I joined, I joined a PIT program. I thought that's going to get me to figure out, that's going to show me exactly where I need to go. I'm still at PIT. It's been a few years. I spent two years waiting, wondering, being extremely frustrated because I saw the other people in my classes, they, were like, they, they knew what they were going to do. They were already in churches, but for some reason, I couldn't find a position to work. I get to my graduation day. I graduate. I still have no idea what I'm going to do. I'm meeting, I have, we, we have, a, my family throws a graduation party for me, and I'm sitting down with a friend of mine, an older friend of mine, and he asks me the worst question that I would never want to hear. What are you going to do? I don't know. And I told him that. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm waiting for God to tell me. So I did mention to him, I'm like, though I, I have had just this random thought every once in a while, possibly looking into maybe teaching. The guy turns to me and he, he says, why don't you come talk to my principal? Here I am five years later as a teacher. I, I did not see this coming. First off, I didn't see becoming a youth pastor. I didn't see that coming. I was going to be a doctor. Then I didn't see becoming a teacher. And yet here I am five years later and I have loved it. What did I do? What do you do if you don't know what to do? Ask God first and foremost. Pray. Ask God to show you where he wants you to go. Second, same thing that he told Joshua. Be grounded in this word. God is the one who gives you the call. If you're not connected to God, how are you going to get the call? Okay. Now, preachers oftentimes say you should be careful what you pray for because God has this great sense of humor in that he will give you what you ask for and it's usually not in the way you're expecting. I would go one step further and say be careful what sermons you say yes to. Because I find myself facing a little bit of a challenge. Five years ago, I joined and became a teacher at a Christian school. And over the course of those five years, I have enjoyed every, well, mostly every minute of it. I mean, teaching junior hires, sometimes it's a little challenging, but... Um, our headmaster has been serving at our school for over 20 years, and he has, he has a few health issues and things, and, and so he's been, he's been in, in the back of his mind, he's been trying to think of who should I ask to take over for? Who should I have move into my spot? I'm pretty sure it's me. I got promoted last year to administrative intern. Doesn't sound like a promotion, but he, what he wants me to see is he wants me to experience all the different things that are in administration. I hate administration. I love teaching and talking with kids and working with them most of the time. I hate the idea of paperwork. And guys, I'm afraid. Because God has this nasty habit of taking me and saying, you need to go here to places I never thought I would ever go. 
And now I am really hoping that God is calling me to stay as a teacher and he's going to provide the sacrificial ram at some point very soon. But if God is calling me to do this, then I guess I gotta take these last words into account. I know what I need to do. There are big shoes to fill. If you are struggling right now, if you have been called to do something, or you, you think you've been called to do something, but in the back of your head, you've been running through all the different reasons why you shouldn't. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go and whatever you do. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it speaks to us every time we open it. I thank you for the life of Joshua and the incredible call that you gave him. But God, I thank you that you do not give us impossible tasks. You give us the victory. You walk through every challenge, every trial with us. God, if we are here tonight and we are feeling called to do something, but we are trying to rationalize it away, I pray that you would make it abundantly clear that this is what you would have us do. And for anyone who is in here, or anyone who listens to this, and you're not sure what God wants you to do, God, I pray that you would meet with them. I pray that you would give them guidance and direction, and that you would point them in the way you would have them go. Lord, please be with us as we leave these doors. Show us where you would have us go and be with us every step of the way. In your name, amen.